This episode is sponsored by Honey Badger. In addition to Honey Badger's great error monitoring service, they also have an uptime monitoring for web developers. And Honey Badger has recently shipped an update that allows for public status pages that can help communicate outages to your customers. In addition to your uptime monitoring, Honey Badger now monitors your SSL certificates. And Honey Badger now has actions which will allow you to do bulk updates to all your errors, or you can set defaults for incoming errors. In this episode, we're going to use a large language model to take a bit of text and determine if it's spam or not. So we have this first text. We'll send it over to our application and we'll see that it is not spam. With the second request, we'll hit the same endpoint, but with a different prompt. When we send this, we'll see that it gets a spam message of true. And we'll create the service using Python and a large language model. It can be fine tuned based on your needs. And then we're going to look at adding this into a Rails application. And as people make comments and they create the comment, It'll go through a check and then determine if it's spam or not. So I'll create a few different comments and you'll see that these are working just fine. However, if we take a text that is a bit more questionable and we create the comment, you'll see that it got flagged as red and you'll be able to handle this however you want in your application, whether you don't even want to post it or if you want to present some kind of error, it's really going to be up to you on your approach in handling these kind of spam messages because you do have to take into consideration that sometimes there could be false positives and other times there could be false negatives. But overall, I found that this is pretty accurate and it works. And the model that we'll use is based on the Roberta model and it has been fine tuned for spam messages. We can go to the GitHub page for this project and they were nice enough to include all of the data sets used for the training all of the test messages, the training messages, as well as the evaluations. And the training data is a CSV with two different columns. You have the label and text. For anything that is spam, the label is spam. And then we have the text that it's registered for spam. But anything that is not spam, it's called ham. And then you have the associated text as well. And so this is a pretty good start. You could even take your own CSV file filled out with your own ham and spams to further fine tune this model if you need to. And we're going to split this episode into two different parts. We'll first build the API that will check if it's spam or ham, and then we'll create the Rails application interface into this API. And the cool part about this API is that we're going to be able to make it pretty much cross-platform. If you want to host this on an Apple Silicon, you would be able to. And that's where it's hosted right now. And it's getting some pretty quick response times for what it's doing. You can also host this on a Windows or Linux machine. And if you're using an NVIDIA graphics card, you can accelerate it with that as well. Or you could just use the CPU. And I did find that the CPU could take upwards of half a second, depending on its performance. But regardless, this whole project takes under one gigabyte of RAM, whether it's the CPU RAM or the VRAM. So the requirements to add something like this is pretty low. And so we'll start out with a fresh folder. And the first thing that I like to do is have a requirements.txt file. And this is where we'll list all the different things that we'll need. We're going to use Torch and then also Transformers. For our local development, I use Flask. But then when we push this for a production instance, we'll use the G-Unicorn. And for my particular case, I like using ASDF. So if I did an ASDF list Python, you'll see that I'm using version 3.11.3. And this is a little bit older. I did test this up to the latest version of 3.11, but there does seem to be some issues with version 3.12. And so we can go ahead and install everything that we need with a pip install dash r, and then we can pass in that requirements file. That'll install these four packages, which I already had them installed on my machine, so it's not going to reinstall them. And then I like breaking up my application into two different parts. I have the app part and then also have the web part. So I'll just create the two different files, the app and the web. And the web is really just going to be our interface. 
So we can import from Flask. We'll import in the Flask and then also the request. We'll set up the app and then we'll create an endpoint for the app route. And then we'll just call this endpoint the check. And then we need to specify the methods that we want for this request. And we're just going to have a post. We can then handle the request and we'll set a prompt is equal to the request.form. We'll get the prompt parameter. So that means that we are expecting on this post request to have a prompt key and an associated value. We can check if the prompt is not present. So if not prompt, then we can return a hash and we'll just say an error. And for this error, prompt parameter is required. And then we'll return the status 400. Otherwise, we can have some kind of detection. And that's where we're going to hit our spam bot. And then we'll just pass in that prompt into our spam bot. So we can make sure that this returns something like a zero or one. And then to the end user, we'll just have a spam. And then we'll set this to the Boolean value of that detection. And so for the spam, this is going to live within our app. So we do need to import in, we'll call it our detector from the app. And one thing I don't like doing here is because we have this app and then we're also naming our app for the flask. I'd rather change this to something a little bit different. So we'll call this detector, which means that we also need to rename our app file to detector. So we're now importing in detector from the detector file. When we are consuming that file, we need to call the detector.spam, or I'm just going to call this the detect. So that means we need some kind of function within that detector called detect. And finally, at the end, we can call the app run, and we'll set our host is equal to, we'll bind it to any interface, and then we'll set our port to 8000. And so that's all we need to do for our web interface. Now, in the detector, we can build the business logic for handling the spam detection. And we can first import in the different libraries that we need. We need the torch library. And then from the transformers library, we need to import in the Roberta tokenizer and also the Roberta, the four sequence classification. And then we need to determine what kind of device we are using. So we can use the torch library and check if CUDA is available. And if it is available, then we can print to the console, something like using CUDA. We can also set our device is equal to the torch device and we'll set it to CUDA. Else if the torch backends MPS is available, that means that we are using the Apple Silicon. So I'll just copy this down and then change the text to say that we're using the Apple Metal and then we'll change our device to MPS. Otherwise, so we'll just do an else and then we'll have it default to the CPU, changing the device to CPU. And you can also put the one in for AMD as well, if that's what you were using. And I'm sure it would work, but I don't have one handy to test that out. So then we can specify the model that we want to use. So I have a model path and then I'll set that equal to the hugging face model that we looked at earlier. We then need to declare two different things. We need a tokenizer. And then we also need our model. The tokenizer is what we're going to pass our text into. And then the model is what we're going to be loading for the sequence classification. So we have our Roberta tokenizer and we're going to call this from the pre-trained and the model path. We then have our model and that's going to be our Roberta for sequence classification from the pre-trained. We can pass in the model path again. And then we specify that the number of labels that we have that we're working with is two because we have the hammer spend column and then we have the text. And then we can push this to the device, which is then going to load it into the GPU memory, either on the NVIDIA graphics card, the Apple Metal, or the CPU and the system RAM. We can then define our method. And if you remember, that is the detect method taking in one parameter for the text. We need to set our inputs and this is going to be with the tokenizer. We'll take in the text. We need to return the tensors is equal to PT. We'll set the padding equal to the max length. We'll specify that the truncation is true 
and the max length, I'm going to set it to 512, but you may want to set this larger depending on the kind of text that you're going to be handling. We can then take our inputs and we'll make it into a hash for a key and the value to device. So we're putting our tokenizer into the GPU memory and we're doing this for the key value in the inputs.items. And so then with the torch dot no grad, which the torch no grad means that we don't need the gradients, which on a production environment, you really don't need. We'll then take our outputs and we'll set that equal to the model and we'll pass in the inputs. We can then return the torch, the argument max of the outputs and the logits. We'll set the dim is equal to one and that's all we have to do. So we have these two different files. We then first trigger and run our web application and we can test this out. If we are using this in production, what I typically do is I comment out the app run because I'm going to be using GUnicorn. So just keep that in mind if you are going to deploy this, otherwise it's going to use Flask. And so to start this up, all we have to do is call the Python and then the web.py. Oh, and I do have a little syntax error here. We need to import in the detector as detector instead of from. So let's try running that again. And we have another little bug. So from the transformers, we need to import in the Roberto tokenizer and the sequence classification. And of course I have a comma missing from the tokenizer. And one more little mistake, I mistyped the Roberta spam. So with that fixed, we can then start this up. You'll see that it's using Apple Metal and now it's up and running. And with the Python service up and running now, we can make a post request to our localhost port 8000 to the check endpoint. We'll have the form data prompt and then we'll have some text. We'll make this request and you'll see that it comes back between 50 and 100 milliseconds and it saw that this text is not spam. We'll then go to our spam check. We'll make the request and the spam is true. And so if you're going to deploy this in a production environment, I like using Docker, but you can use whatever you want really. So I'm going to create a Docker file and I'm not going to really go in depth on this and I'll just paste it in so you can see what we're going to be doing. And so this Docker file is pretty simple. We have our Python image. We're updating this image. We have our work directory that we're installing to the app. We're copying over everything into the app directory. We're then installing all of the libraries that we need based on the requirements TXT. And for our application, I'm using the NVIDIA graphics drivers. So you can use whatever you want, but I'm not sure what you would need to add into here if you are using Docker on Apple Metal or if you're using AMD graphics. If you are using just CPU, then you wouldn't need those. And then we're exposing port 5000 using GUnicorn with two workers to listen on any interface on port 5000. And then we're launching the web app. And if you are going to deploy this with something like Docker Compose, it's also fairly simple where you really don't need the build command because we are just going to reference an image, but we also have the command where it's going to run the GUnicorn with two workers listening on any interface. We then are launching the web app. Again, we're just forwarding port 5000 and we're saying that we are using the NVIDIA graphics. You also need to have a deployed resources, reservations, devices, capabilities, and then specify the GPU if you are going to be using a physical GPU. And so these should give you a good base point, but you may need to tweak it a bit depending on your situation. And one other thing that you may want to consider is that you may want to have a local volume mount for the models. And I believe that's going to be under if we set a volumes and if we set this to whatever user that we have, it's going to be something like root.cache and then hugging face or something else like that. But if we just set the root cache to something like this, then our local user on the machine that we're deploying to would have a dot cache folder. And you can really call this whatever you want, like a model cache or whatever. And that's going to mount into the running image with a dot cache under the root user. So that way, once you download that model, any subsequent deployments that you do, you won't have to re-download that model. You can just load it in from your local storage. 
but now we're ready to consume this on our Rails application. And so to start off with this application, because it's not really relevant for this particular episode, but I'll do a quick run through of what we have set up. I have a comment system set up for posts. So I can create a comment and it'll use turbo frame tags and broadcasts to broadcast out the messages to this browser and any other browser that's listening on this channel. So with two different browser sessions, I can then make a comment and it appears on both sides. We can also edit comments and it'll update on both sides and delete them and it deletes on both sides as well. And so we'll do a quick run through on this where a post has many comments and the comment belongs to the post. On the post show page, we are turbo streaming from the post. And then we have a turbo frame tag for the comments and that's reaching out to our comments controller. And then it'll replace the comments turbo frame tag with whatever's rendered in there. We then also have a form partial for our comments that we can then post back to this post as well as that new comment. The comments form partial is a turbo frame tag. So that's going to get replaced after we make a comment and that'll go to our comments create action. Our comments partial that we are displaying out everything. We have a turbo frame tag with a DOM ID for the comment, which is going to be very important because in our model, we have for the comments, the broadcast to the post. That means that any updates creates or destroys that we do, it's then going to broadcast back. And because this is a comment model, it's going to look for an ID element of comments. So this turbo frame tag comments that everything is going to be wrapped in is very important. The index action for this, we are replacing that turbo frame tag with this turbo frame tag. So any creates is going to append to this frame. We're then rendering out each one of the comments. And again, the comments has a turbo frame tag and has a DOM ID for the comment. And that DOM ID for the comment is really important because that's going to set up the ID attribute for this turbo frame tag. And so any edits or destroys, it's then going to target this one specifically, and then it's going to make the change. And so we'll first start out with adding a migration and we need to add some fields. We'll just call this the spam fields to our comments. We'll have a spam and it's going to be a Boolean. And then we'll also have a spam checked on. And that's going to be a date time because we want to know when the spam was checked on. Once we have that migration, we'll edit this migration. And so this is going to be the first decision that you need to make. Depending on how you're going to implement this into your application, do you want the spam to be default to true or false. So if you want to be a bit more relaxed, maybe there's some networking issue or there is an issue with the spam API service. Do you want comments to not be visible or visible by default? So I'm going to be a bit more permissive and I'm going to set the default to false. So that means that there is a chance that others may see this before the spam check has actually occurred. And we're going to look at some ways that we can mitigate that as well. But if that is a large concern, then you would probably want to set the spam boolean to a defaulted true. With that change made, we'll go ahead and run the Rails DB migrate to migrate the database. And so we need to determine when do we actually need to check the spam? Because right now, if we go into our model and into the comments, we're going to broadcast to our post any new comments that are created. Depending on your situation, again, you need to make a decision here if you want to do that or if you do not want to broadcast by default. If you want to first make sure that it has passed these spam checks, then we will need to create these broadcasts manually. And so these broadcasts, you could have an after create commit. Then there's also an after update commit. And there's also an after destroy commit. So with each one of these, you can do whatever you need to, but the default behavior for something like this is going to be a broadcast and we'll fix these, but essentially it's going to the post. So for the after create, it's going to be an append for an after update. We're going to then replace and an after destroy, we're then going to remove. So the after create is going to add it to our view. The after update 
is then going to replace the existing element on the page and the after destroy is then going to remove it. But in our cases, we may not need all of these, but one that we are going to need is after create. So after it's created, instead of broadcasting just yet, instead, we need to check for the spam. So I'm going to create a background job and we'll just call it the check for spam. And it is going to be a job we'll perform later and then pass in the self. I don't like doing this in line because we are making an API request outside of our application. However, you may decide that with your application, with your networking, you're confident in the way things are set up and you've eliminated any single point of failures. You also have fast computers and the inference shouldn't take too long. You could have a before create callback that then does this check in line instead of calling out to a separate service that happens in the background. That's going to be the most straightforward way because you are then going to be able to get instant feedback on whether or not the spam check is passed or not. However, again, if there's any network latencies or if that service is down, then you're going to have to gracefully handle those and decide what you want to do with that comment. But assuming that this is going to be a third-party service, I'm going to put this in a background job. So now, we're not going to be broadcasting anything, but if a user were to refresh their page, then they would see that comment. So we will need to fix that in a bit as well. But I'll go ahead and create this job with a Rails generate job, and then we'll create that check for spam. This check for spam job, we are going to be using a few different built-in libraries. I like using the net HTTP. However, you can use whatever you want. We're then going to perform. We are taking in our comment and we can get our prompt because I am using action text for the content. So we have a has rich text content that does make it a little bit more complicated, but it's still not too bad because we can take our comment. We can get the content, which is the action text. And we just want to get the plain text. We then need to set up our URI, which we can do a URI.parse. And typically I would put this into an environment variable, but for now, I'm just going to hard code it for my application with the localhost port 8000 and forward slash check. We'll create a new HTTP instance with net HTTP and we'll get our URI.host and the URI port. I also like setting the use SSL is equal to true if the URI scheme is equal to the HTTPS. Depending on your use case, you may need to set a timeout. I'll set it to 10 seconds and you can also do something for a read timeout, but that's really up to you on how you want to handle those. We'll then have our request to the net HTTP and this can be a post request to our URI and the request underscore URI. We'll set our form data with the request.set form data, and we're passing in our prompt with the prompt. We'll set our response is equal to the HTTP.request for our request. Our result is going to be a JSON.parse, and we'll parse the response.body. And so you do want to make sure that you have some rescues in here. You can rescue from the standard error or whatever else you want, but you may want to have some kind of retry logic. But personally, what I would do is I would have some more specific error handlings for the net HTTP timeout, or depending on one of these, if we got a response back, that was some kind of error, but I'll leave it up to you on how you want to handle those. We can then check if the defined, and we want to check our result and the spam. And the reason why I'm not just doing a, if the result is spam, because that's going to be true or false. I just want to see if the result spam is defined. If it is defined, then we know we did get a successful response. And regardless of what that result is, we want to update our comment. So we can update the comment with the spam checked on and we'll set it to the time.now and we'll set the spam to the result of that spam. If something did happen, but we didn't get an error or the error wasn't caught, then you need to handle that kind of logic however you need to. 
And so for our application, I'm going to go ahead and create two different comments. We'll have, this is a good message, and then let's look at the logs. So if we scroll up a bit, we'll see where we posted our comment, and then we inserted the comments, and we also inserted in the action text. And then if we scroll down a bit, we have our check for spam job. This loaded our comment and the action text. And if we go down a bit, we'll see that we got an update. So this updated our comments, it updated the spam checked on, and it updated it to the current time. Notice it did not update our spam attribute, and that's because it was already false, so there was nothing it needed to do. But notice that it did not broadcast. So I'll refresh the page, we then see our message. I'm then going to go ahead and write some kind of spam message. And so with this message, this will get flagged as spam, we'll create the comment, Again, it did not get flagged, but I'll refresh the page and we'll see it there. If we go back to our logs, we'll scroll up a bit. We now see the update where we have the spam is equal to and the spam check is equal to. The spam was set to one, meaning that it was flagged as spam and we got the spam check on that particular date and time. And so for now, if we want to be a little bit more permissive with our application, we can go ahead and broadcast our posts. So that means any kind of create or updates will get broadcasted. It's also going to check our spam job after the create commit. So if a spam was created, it's still going to get broadcasted, but then it's going to get updated and handled separately. Depending on what you want to do, you may want to have it flagged for individual review or Maybe what you want to do is to just let the user know like, hey, this message was spam. It was caught by our filters, but we're going to go ahead and display it to you unless if you report it or something. So in our view for the comments in our comment partial where we have our header, we could do a check changing the class. If the comment dot spam, if that is true, then we can do some kind of class. Maybe we want to do a background of danger. We could also do something similar for the body, where if it is spam, then maybe we want to do the background danger subtle. So the way that's going to look is any kind of blue text is either not checked or it is not spam. And then we have any spam message is in red. So I'm going to come down and I'm going to just make the same post again. And what we'll probably see is that it's going to flash blue then almost immediately flash red. So it did do that. And as you can see that it did get flagged as spam. If on your application, you want to be just a lot more aggressive against spam. So you have fine tuned this model and you want to just destroy the comment. If it is spam, there is no second chance. You can do a comment destroy if it is spam. And what that'll look like if we copy this and then we paste it in, we should see it pop up but then almost immediately delete. So we didn't even see it pop up because it happened so fast. If we look at our logs, we'll see where the check for spam job occurred. It deleted the rich text and that got broadcasted out, removing that comment. And so there's a lot of ways that you can handle this. And this is really just a couple. In our controllers, where we are getting all of the comments, you could also do a search here where the spam is set to false. And so this way, we're not even going to display the spam. We can come back and refresh and you won't even see it. If we make another comment, you'll see that this came in correctly, but maybe we'll have some other kind of spam comment and that got flagged and removed almost immediately. And so there's a lot of different approaches that you can do with handling these spam messages. And hopefully this gives you some different kind of approaches that you can take while using a large language model and machine learning. Again, it's not foolproof. And a few iterations that you can do on something like this is if you have a flag mechanism where you can report a post, this can get bundled up. And at the end of the day or something, depending on what you decide, whether it's a safe post or not, you can then feed this back to the API. And in that Python application, you can then further train your model so it just gets better and better over time. Well, that's all for this episode. Thanks for watching.
For more videos, check out driftandruby.com.